However, why invite someone in and get access to your data, access to your customer information, allow them to train their algorithms and their AI systems against your customer base for them to eventually profit off that and you be left out in the cold? What about the risk to the fundamental business model, which is relationship banking for most of our credit unions posed by fintechs? And why isn't that one of the primary concerns? Hey, real quick, before we start the video, I just want to say this is probably one of my longer videos. I just took a shot at really taking my time and really getting into it. I'm shooting this after I've completed the entire video. I had during while shooting, I had a little health scare. And, and while shooting the video, I had a little health scare and I discussed it a little bit toward the end. So if you like this longer form, kind of slow cooking content, you know, 20, 30 minute videos will have you make sure you let me know in the comments and, you know, just give me your thoughts and your feedback. So enjoy the video. Bye. Greetings and welcome to the Ag Synergy Show. I'm your host, Anson Cooley, the owner and principal of Synergy Credit Union Consulting and Synergy Bank Consulting. At both our firms, we provide strategic planning, board governance training, audit and supervisory committee training, risk management, and operational consulting services. In this video, we're going to cover a few things. Number one, we're going to cover Fiserv's recent application for special purpose banking charter. From there, we're going to cover the recent history of fintechs applying for banking charters and where they are in that process. And I'm going to delve a little bit deep into terms of being able to distinguish between uh, fintechs that are potential strategic partners versus fintechs that will ultimately become competitors. From there, I'm going to discuss the recent rulemaking that came out regarding financial innovations that essentially is a, a rule that will allow credit unions and fintechs to originate more loans together and the impacts to the credit union industry. And then I'll have some closing remarks on how as a credit union industry, we can ensure that we don't expose ourselves to too much strategic risk. And real quick, I'm going to go ahead and put chapters in this video. It's going to be my first time trying that so that you can kind of jump around to the, the sections that you may or may be more interested in. So look for look for that in the bottom of the video. So what we have here is a article from the American Banker dated January 2024. And above here, here's a snippet. It says the bank technology seller Spicer has applied for a merchant acquirer limited purpose bank charter in Georgia that would allow Fiserv to control the entire payment process, including authorizing, settling, and clearing debit and credit card transactions. Fiserv normally uses bank partners as part of the payment processing. And FinTech's warning banking charters isn't anything really new or novel. Here's an article by Finch Rate Ratings from October, 2022. So it says here, U.S. non-financial technology firms, fintechs, and other non-bank financial institutions may be at a com competitive and funding disadvantage to banks if they're unable to access depository funding through industrial loan company charters. And let's pause there for a second. That's what this is about. Like you're saying, just think about the long-term, I uh, guess, strategic move here. Fintechs at this moment, because they don't have access to a charter, they can't use deposits to fund their loans. They have to use private equity. If they get access to this a charter, now all of a sudden they're competing with our financial institutions for the same deposits that you're trying to get. And as you can see here from the same article, here are just a few of the fintech companies that have applied for industrial loan charters uh, over the last uh, three to four years. And I think, I guess if I was to acknowledge someone that might persnickety say, in a persnickety way, say, you know, Anson, this is an inevitable evolution of the process. Disruption is going to happen. I get it. I think it's going to happen 
in the future and there's nothing we can really do about it. However, why invite someone in and get access to your data, access to your customer information, allow them to train their algorithms and their AI systems against your customer base for them to eventually profit off that and you be left out in the cold. And let's be clear, not all fintechs have the same business model and same strategic aspirations. Some fintechs are just technology companies that support credit unions and community banks in being better at what they do, meaning they help financial institutions with digital onboarding. They help them with back office information. They help them, they're developing AI algorithms to help streamline processes and reduce overhead. Whereas there are other fintechs, they're fintechs, but what they really are, are are indirect lenders and participation companies who essentially want to do the same thing that you're doing. They just can't or they can, but they want access to your deposits because for them, as it was highlighted in the article, it's cheaper from a cost standpoint for them to partner with a credit union than to go out on the, I guess, the private market and going to the capital markets and get more money to fund their lending operations. I'll say it one more time. What happens when they get the charter and they don't need you anymore? So let's keep moving. Let's take a look at what I perceived to be the plan B or the fallback position for some fintechs when they realized they weren't gonna be able to get financial institution charters. So what am I referring to? I'm referring to the recent changes to 12 CFR part 701 and 714, financial innovation, loan participations, eligible obligations, and notes of liquidating credit unions. So we have a question that we need to ask. Why did we need this rule? And what was this rule attempting to address for FinTech companies that needed access to credit union deposits. So what we have here is a post from the NCUA dated December 2022 before the rule was finalized. This is NCUA board members Rodney Hood's statements on the proposed rule, essentially him putting forth his reasons why he thinks the proposal should be put forth. And of note, he also did outline some potential questions and concerns that he had about the rule. Before I go through this, three things. One, board member Hood is a kind and brilliant man. I've had an opportunity to meet him twice and he's, his energy is infectious and he's always gracious, full stop, no but. Two, the people that worked on this that he outlines in this particular statement did do, they did amazing work on putting together this, this particular rule. It, it's brilliantly written. And lastly, whoever did the branding and PR rollout for this particular rule, good stuff, like good stuff i mean just when you when you read the statements that all the board members made it, it even if there was someone that wanted to try to stop it who would want to be against financial inclusion and who could refute credit unions getting access to younger members but in my i guess my critique i'm just going to give some commentary into why that really wasn't the real reason why we did this rule because remember Go back to the article that we showed earlier, the opening statement, fintechs and other non-bank financial institutions may be at a competitive funding disadvantage to banks, and let's just say banks and credit unions, if they are unable to access depository funding. So here's the gist of it. It says here, and I'm gonna skip around to try to get the, I guess the, the, the spirit of it. 
It says our current regulations have prescriptive limits for credit unions being able to compete in this market. And if changes are not made to the regulations, credit unions may never be able to regain their presence in the new normal of lending. Today's proposed rule, if enacted as a final rule, will clarify that credit unions that acquired loans through an indirect lending relationship, such as from fintechs, could qualify as the originating lender and be eligible to participate the loan to other institutions in an elegant way. Here's more. It says the proposed changes before the board today would narrow the application of the 5% limitation. Okay. Where is that 5% limitation? It says the current Loan purchasing regulations, which we are proposing to change, only allow a federal credit union to purchase the loans of its members from any source up to 5% of the purchasing financial institutions unimpaired capital and surplus. And so from the perspective of maybe like a fintech or someone interested and doing business with a fintech, that 5% limitation was extremely restrictive. And another thing, and I'm honestly still trying to wrap my, my, my arms around this entire regulation because as I'm, I was just you know researching, trying to get ready for this video, I'm looking through this regulation and one of the things that I guess my mind wanted to be there, when it says here, it says the final rule amends 702.23. And in this particular bullet, it says that it narrows the application of the 5% limit, okay? My mind wants there to be some backstop limit, meaning, all right, 5% may not apply, but you can do as much as 20%. And if you have certain procedures and policies and you show yourself to have the requisite knowledge, skills, and ability, yeah, yeah, you can maybe do up to 40%. Did this rule eliminate all limits for credit unions doing indirects? That's one, and I'm asking this, this is just a question. But then also, guess what else it did? It removed ca the camel rating requirement as well, and to also be well capitalized. So let's look at that real quick. So now we're back to Mr. Hood's statement, board member Hood's statement on this particular rule. Okay, and he's just kind of, he's at a board meeting and he's explaining, I guess, the intentionality around the rule. It says this rule would remove the requirement. So this is an additional provision of the rule in addition to the five, you know, narrowing the 5% limitation. This rule would remove the requirement for certain credit unions. And we're going to come back to what certain credit unions, who are certain credit unions? Okay, this move, this rule would remove the requirement for certain credit unions to request NCA approval to purchase certain non-member loans from other federally insured credit unions. Currently, only credit unions rated one or, or two and classified as well capitalized may engage in this activity without prior approval. These credit unions, who are these? These credit unions will now be able to purchase these types of eligible obligations after establishing sound policies without having to send in a written request for approval. Who are certain credit unions and who are these credit unions? These are credit unions that are risk rated three, four, and five. I used to work as a regulatory examiner, OCC. I used to be, work for the OCC as a bank examiner. And I worked there from 2003, give or take 2008. I was there during the de novo phase where we were, you know, doing de novos. There were community banks popping up on every corner. And I was there right at the point when we started downgrading financial institutions and started closing them, closing them, okay? 
Financial institutions rated three, four, and five have shown weaknesses in often have shown weaknesses in asset quality, interest rate risk, liquidity risk, and more, more importantly, weaknesses in management. Okay. And so when we remove that requirement, and then I'm just looking at the rule here, they remove the requirement, but then they turn back and they added a safety and soundness. Specifically, it says it, it adds safety and soundness requirements concerning purchases of eligible application obligations to offset risk associated with removing the camel ratings and well capitalized requirements from paragraph B6. Why not just leave the cap the camels requirements in? and the cap allowed them to say that they have to be well capitalized before they delve into a type of lending that is inherently riskier even if you have all the things that are noted here even if you have a well-written board policy risk assessments risk management processes commensurate with the size, scope, and type and complexity, indirect lending in and of itself is a, a more inherently riskier lending type, even for our one and two risk rated credits, but more credit unions, more so for our three, four, and five rated institutions. Hey, how you doing? I can explain. It's been about about two days since I started the beginning of the video and I had to just put the video down and take care of some things. And I'll explain that at the end of the video. But right now, what I want to do is to conclude it. And I want to, as I land this, I want to provide you just with some perspectives of the different players I think are involved in the types, in the decisions that we have to make for our industry. Okay. And so I wrote some down here. And so these are the players and the potential perspectives that these players um, may have, I guess, with regard to just fintech and things of that nature and indirect. So first, first group of stakeholders, if you will, are the fintechs themselves. Um, from a fintech perspective, they are attempting to improve shareholder value. They're doing their job as a corporation that's serving shareholders or private equity holders. Okay. The question I would have for that particular group is this. Um, now that essentially the cat's out of the bag that fintechs are attempting to get charters, what happens when your clients start making the, or if your clients start making different decisions around partner partnering with you because they realize that you're going to eventually become a competitor. And so, you know, like if you're a credit union and you're looking at Pfizer renewing a contract or considering them, I'm personally, I think a credit union may look at it and say, you know what? I might go with this this QSO, or I might go with this other fintech that isn't openly attempting to compete with me in the in the space. So that's just something to consider for fintechs. But from my perspective, they're just doing what they think is best for their for their shareholders. Now the next group are credit union professionals. And I want to quantify this group or just kind of describe this group. These are individuals that are in this space, not necessarily for love of the cooperative movement. It was a job opportunity, meaning there weren't as many opportunities in the to be a CEO at the community banking space. It was crowded. Old man Jim didn't want me to be a CEO. He wanted his son, that kind of thing. So they end up in our space, the cooperative space, not with the same motivations. And so often their, their actions are driven by short-term gains and, and short-term gains that sometimes come become personal gains. And I understand that as well, meaning we all do not have to have the same perspective around what should be the outcomes for this credit union movement. And I think there's space for us all here. 
my question to these individuals is this. You had an opportunity, at least from my perspective, you got a seat, you're, you're a manager, a CEO, and you had an opportunity to be a bank CEO. Why try to turn an industry which has a, a form and a function, meaning it's member owned, it's a cooperative movement, into what you need it to be to serve yourself personally? What, is, what does that look like? It means not looking at strategic decisions based on their long-term effects for your credit union and primarily looking at them from through the lens of how can I get to the bag quicker? All right, put that down. I'm glad I took a day or two off of this because I think if I would have came at it hot off the rest of the, the, the video, I think my animus or my energy would have been different. And I think that what my goal has been this year is to try to, I don't know, just seek connection and be empathetic to all the different perspectives involved. The next group of stakeholders are the credit union professionals that bleed the cooperative movement that are looking for um, this, this movement to be around. And I would, let me, let me put who should be in this group, millennials and everybody that's coming after, meaning we, myself included, I'm an elder millennial. I need the credit union movement to be around. I'm not, you know, I have another 20, 30 years. I'd like to work within this industry. And so the decisions that individuals are making today, they impact the viability of the industry going forward. But moreover, there's from a, I guess, a more populist or people perspective, there's professionals that really care about their members and the communities they serve, and they want their credit union to be around to serve them. The question that I have for those group of individuals is where are you? Where's your voice? Another question I would have is, are you willing to compromise? And what I mean by that is this, going up against pure capitalists requires ca compromise. If you're too rigid in your view of what the cooperative movement is and the amount of, I guess, capitalism that's infiltrated, if you will, this cooperative movement, then you're going to lose all the time if you're very straight and narrow. You're going to have to compromise on some things in order to get this done and, and try to preserve the movement. Okay. The next group are the state leagues. And here's, and then and when you think about state leagues, state, league, state leagues are supposed to serve their entire membership base, the, both the small and the large credit unions. However, often, it looks as if, at least from my perspective, a lot of the comments around certain legislation, they lean more toward a particular ilk of credit union that's seeking to grow quickly and loosen up regulations to support that growth, regardless of how it can potentially impact the credit union industry at large. And so when I, here's the question that I have for state leagues. One, where's the representation of board members on your, on your state league boards? When you look across the country, the fewer, fewer and fewer board members are also on state league boards. Many state league boards are entirely represented by CEOs. And with that comes a particular perspective. And so my, the next question to state leagues is this, who are you, who do you serve? Are you there as a state league to serve your membership? Are you there to serve the board members of the credit unions? Are you there to serve the credit union as an entity? Or are you there to serve the CEOs that represent their credit unions on your state league boards. Those are all different constituencies. And I guess if we were to take a, a step back and look at the comments on a lot of legislation, 
you can look at how many instances where the term regulatory burden is thrown around. And I can see how, you know, when you read something, there could be a lot of regulatory burden around, let's just say from a CEO's perspective, succession planning. You read the comments, period. And it's like, oh, we, you know, we don't want the NCUA to prescribe this because of the regulatory burden. Well, that's one perspective in the, and when you read the comment from the league, that's the one that's being put forth. But from a member's perspective that would like to keep their credit union, that regulatory burden in that instance around the succession planning ensures that they keep their credit union. So who's perspective is being put forth, you know, in terms of representing, being represented through the leagues. And lastly, the NCUA. And so this comment is more directed to the, I guess, the Washington folks, not necessarily the rank and file who, uh, in my opinion, do an amazing job. Okay. So we just released the 2024 strategic risk priorities. I forget what they call them. Okay. We outlined credit risk, liquidity risk, interest rate risk, I think BSA, some IT, but let's focus on just credit, liquidity, and interest rate risk. What's one of the main things that's creating credit risk in the system is a lot of our indirect portfolios. And so my, my question also is, what about strategic risk? I think strategic risk is probably one of the fundamental risks that's affecting our credit unions because that the strategic risk in the industry is driving the credit risk, liquidity risk, and the interest rate risk. And fintechs have the potential to fundamentally disrupt our business model, which has been relationship banking, meaning we're outsourcing that first touch point to another entity. And I just think that that has the potential to have dire consequences across the entire credit union system. I just thank y'all for being with me. If you've been this long, we'll see. I'll look at the data and see how many people stayed the entire video, but I just wanted to take a shot at long form content. Now, just b before I wrap up, one of the things that, one of the reasons why I had to stop is because I wasn't feeling well. As I was doing a video earlier, well, the two days ago, have you, my blood pressure was like 147 over 112 and I didn't realize it. And I'm a generally, I like to think I'm, I eat healthy. I, I run often, but I'm saying this to say, just take, you know, realize as you're watching this, that they may, you know, watch the stress, watch what you're eating. And as I hate, I had to literally between the beginning of the video where we are now, I went and got, went to the doctor, got some blood pressure medicine that I hope I won't be on for a long time. But, um, I don't know, just take care of yourself, take a breather and don't stress. All right. So thank you for your time. If you like the content, if you like how I communicate things, I would love your support. Just make sure you subscribe. Have a great and blessed day.